Welcome to Courtroom Communication Skills. I'm Marsha Hunter. And I'm Brian Johnson. This is program one called Finding Your Style. And in this program, you'll recognize why it's essential to control your body, your brain, and your voice in the courtroom. You will also learn why being natural is not enough in the courtroom. What you need is a reliable technique as an advocate. You'll recognize how you can look, feel, and sound confident by controlling your actions in court. We'd like to answer a fundamental question, especially in this first program. And the question is, how do you speak persuasively as you think on your feet? How do you speak? What's going on with your voice? Is it loud enough? How fast do you talk? How do you think? When you draw an objection in court, what's happening inside your brain? And what's happening when you're actually on your feet in court, when you're standing up in front of a jury or in front of a judge? What behaviors of your body can help your brain and your voice get the job done in court? As with any complicated skill, the only way to understand it and get better at it is to break it down into its component parts. So that's what we are going to do in this program. We're going to take this very complex skill of speaking persuasively and we're going to break it down so you can understand the individual component parts and then ultimately put those parts back together in a way that works for you. Going back to our question, how do you speak persuasively as you think on your feet? We're going to start backwards and start first with your body. What's happening with your body when you're standing up in court? How are you coping with the excitement of adrenaline's rush? You've never considered in law school physiology or kinesiology. We're going to speak very briefly about what's going on with your body in court. In the same way that adrenaline affects one's body, it also affects our brain. So we're going to look very specifically at how your brain is affected by adrenaline and how that can actually help you remember and structure what it is that you want to say in court. And then, of course, there's your voice. How loud is it? How fast do you talk? Are you able to choose just the right words? Can you give the proper emphasis when it's really important? so that your listeners, the fact finders, the judge, the jury, all get your message crystal clear. They know exactly what you're talking about because the way you use your voice is so efficient. Ultimately, we're here to talk about your style. So in no way are we saying do what we do. You've got a unique body, a unique brain, a unique voice, and therefore our goal is to give you our technique so you can figure out your personal style. And personal style is that. It is highly personal. It's often called the art of advocacy because like any other art form, there are many different ways to achieve what you want. Like the art of painting, there can be the radically different styles of the old master Rembrandt in contrast with the modern master Picasso. Well, our goal is to give you that ability to analyze yourself and your own style so that you can be your most persuasive self as the advocate in court. Given that you have a unique body, brain, and voice, when you stand up in court, why not just follow this instruction? Be natural. On some level, that makes perfect sense, doesn't it? You want to be perceived as being your natural, authentic self. So why not give yourself that instruction? Just get up there and be yourself, be natural. There's a logic to it. I want to project that to you as I'm speaking here in this program, like you want to project that to the jury, and the only way one can do that is to feel within oneself that, hey, this is really me. I'm not acting or role-playing or pretending. So why not just be natural? Well, woven into that notion of be natural is something that we have come to call the paradox of naturalness. And the paradox is this. Let's first of all define natural. Let's say that natural is what you and I do in the course of our everyday lives when we're our most relaxed, at ease, comfortable selves, and we're not self-aware because there's no reason to be self-conscious. It's you and me standing in the corridor talking at your law firm, for example. 
So if that's what natural is, the paradox of naturalness is this. Sometimes being natural, engaging in those everyday behaviors that we do when we're not thinking about it, can paradoxically make us appear to be unnatural. And the reverse is also true. Sometimes you have to do unnatural, incredibly technical behaviors if you want to come across as natural in the courtroom. Here's what I mean by that notion of the paradox of naturalness. Let's start with my body. Consider the way that I'm standing here talking to you as you might stand in a court and ask yourself this question, is this behavior natural, physically? And the answer, of course, is no. If you and I were standing in a corridor having a conversation in the context of just casual shoot the breeze, neither one of us would be engaged in this kind of formal behavior. Natural would look and feel different than that, wouldn't it? We would shift and we would adjust and in conversation you wouldn't see any of that behavior. And if I needed to scratch my nose, you wouldn't see that. If I had hair and needed to brush it from my forehead or push up my glasses, none of that behavior would be even apparent to you, much less distracting, because it's natural. But think just about that kind of physical behavior, that way we behave when we're being ourselves. If you stand up in court with that behavior, may it please the court, Your Honor, and you engage in that behavior, suddenly those natural behaviors appear to be in court unnatural, given the heightened scrutiny of the jury. So as you're standing in court, as I'm standing here talking to you, I am much more formal than is natural to appear natural. I'm trying to eliminate all those personal tics and mannerisms that we all have, the pushing up the glasses or the brushing back the hair, because as natural as that may be, it's not appropriate to what it is that I'm doing right now. And it's complicated by the fact that at the same time I'm trying to eliminate or control certain behaviors, I'm trying to liberate other behaviors like natural gestures that we'll talk about in a moment. So be natural isn't enough for the body because the body will inevitably naturally engage in behaviors that appear to be unnatural. Take what I'm doing with my brain as I speak to you, trying to track along with what it is that I want to say here. But let's focus on what you need to do with your brain in court. And is be natural the proper instruction for your brain when you're doing something, say, like direct examination? I think it's one of the hardest things to do well because there is no natural model for the thinking required in direct examination. You know, think about it. When in conversation do you ever ask an extended series of questions to which you already know the answer? Never. In conversation you ask questions when you do not know the answer. And yet in trial, what you want to do is only ask questions to which you know the answer, which is fundamentally unnatural. So you can't stand up and do a direct and just say, be natural, because that will not get you to the solution. Or think about how cross-examination, in all those textbooks about cross-examination, there's some instruction that says, now do not ask that one question too many. Well, where is that? Naturally in conversation, we never restrict ourselves to that. We get to that ultimate question. Or think about argument, how in argument, in conversation, there's often a lot of reference to I. Here's what I think, and here's who I voted for, and here's what I believe. And you can't do that in an argument in court. The personal pronoun I has no place whatsoever. You cannot vouch for a witness by saying, I thought, and I believe what that witness said. But that's naturally what we would do in argument. So be natural doesn't help the brain very much. Now, finally, to your voice. Be natural as an instruction to your voice isn't very helpful for a number of reasons. You need to speak more clearly, more crisply, often louder in court than you would in conversation. And you want to eliminate those natural thinking noises um, that we um, you know, um, all use um, in conversation. Um, well, as natural as they are, you don't want them to be part of your courtroom style. So be natural is not enough because of this paradox of naturalness. What you need is a solid technique. And by technique, I really mean this. The technique is that set of answers that technically solve the issues for you to get you to speak persuasively in court and to coordinate your body, your brain, and your voice. And technique is the threshold level of skill below which you never fall. Anyone who performs under pressure regularly as a professional has to have a technique. You know, think about it. Professional athletes, they have a technique. Professional musicians, they have a technique. Professional actors who perform have a technique. And you, as an advocate in the courtroom, must have a reliable technique. A technique 
that always allows you to be this good and often better. So whether you're recovering from the flu, you've had no sleep, you're in the midst of a family crisis, you think, boy, this is not going to be easy, but thank goodness I have technique. I'm always this good. And often I transcend that and am better because that's what technique gives you, is a solid answer to the question. So to understand how the rest of this program plays out and what our technique is based on, it really is based on a variation of the old question of which comes first? Is it the chicken or is it the egg? Well, of course, you have to have a chicken to get an egg, but then an egg to get a chicken, and around we go with that circular logic. Our technique is based on a slightly different variation. Which comes first, the way you're feeling or the way you're acting? The actions of your body that are often provoked by the way that you are feeling. So think how often the way we are feeling leads us to behave in a certain way. Let's take nervousness under pressure as an advocate in court. So many people describe, boy, I had that feeling of nervousness. I had so much nervous energy. And that feeling of nervousness leads to a certain kind of action. Very often because there's extra energy as part of that nervousness, the person looks nervous because they act as if they're nervous. There's often what we would call that dance of discomfort going on, where the feet are moving around a lot, although not really going anywhere. Or even if the feet don't move, there's often this sense of advocacy on the high seas where the body rocks back and forth. And of course, that's the nervous energy in the legs propelling the body back and forth. And often, it's that rocking advocate who's the only person in the courtroom not aware of it. The observer thinks, boy, that guy looks nervous. He's rocking back and forth. And that is the action that results from that feeling. What's the opposite feeling? Well, someone who's calm, at ease, natural, behaves differently. They simply stand still. They lose all that nervous dance of discomfort. That's one example. Another example of this feeling-action equation is often played out with gestures. If you focus your hands, where we tend to never focus our eyes, focus on my hands, and is this not how nervous people gesture? Look at my hands. May it please the court, your honor, I'm nervous, you know it, everyone knows it, because these are the gestures, the actions of a nervous person. And technically, we could describe that as what? Well, they're small and fast and jerky. And those small, fast, jerky gestures are a giveaway that say, boy, I'm nervous, and you can see it, just my gestures alone tell you that. What's the opposite of that? Well, someone who is more comfortable gestures differently. Those small gestures loosen up and get bigger. Those fast gestures slow down. And those jerky gestures are suddenly smooth. In fact, consider that compliment, man. She is smooth as an advocate. Why do we use that as the compliment? Why not the opposite? Man, he is so jerky as an advocate, so effective. Because it's literally not true. The person who's comfortable is smooth. The person who is nervous engages in the actions that are small and fast and jerky. And maybe the most interesting and final connection between how we feel and how we're acting has to do with the speed at which we talk. Why do all nervous people talk too fast? Why has no one ever said to me, you have to help me when I get nervous, I, s I slow down and talk so slowly? No one ever says that. It's true of all of us, myself included. When we get nervous, we tend to talk too fast. Think about the fact that if, if, I, if I just speed up the way that I'm talking right now and I, I, I stumble over my words and I, I trip over my tongue, immediately the action of these articulators, the lips, the tongue, the jaw, interacting with the teeth, the speed with which I'm talking, that action is a giveaway about how that guy's feeling. Boy, he sounds nervous because he's talking too fast. And what's the opposite of that? Well, someone who speaks in a more moderate tempo, like I'm talking now, conveys by that tempo alone that I'm not nervous because nervous people don't talk with this tempo. Ner 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 nervous, nervous people talk in a different way. So here's that feeling action equation in play. Feelings are hard to control. Actions, relatively easy. If there were a switch that we could turn off to say, boy, I'm nervous, and now I wish I weren't nervous, so I'll throw that switch. Ah, well, now I'm relaxed and at ease and natural. But it doesn't work that way. So let's not worry about the feelings so much because they are very difficult to control. Let's instead worry about actions because actions are things we can control. In fact, think about how people who perform for a living engage in certain ritualized actions. Think about how the baseball player who walks into the batter's box has a certain ritual of physically preparing to swing that bat. 
or the golfer preparing to hit that ball has a certain uh, ritualized set of actions as to how they're going to stand and how they're going to focus and how they're going to breathe and how they're going to swing before they actually do that. So let's get control of the body by getting control of the actions and let's even ritualize those actions. Let's get them under our conscious control and let's do that before we begin. In other words, none of this will interfere with content and trying to remember what you want to say because we're going to do that in advance. Like a sprinter in the Olympics who is in advance ready to run when they hear, sprinters take your marks, get set, and before the go, before the judge says counsel, you may proceed. You're ready to go because physically you have set yourself up to be ready to go. And now here's where the chicken and egg comes in. As I said earlier, the way we feel provokes certain actions and the way we behave with the actions of our body provokes certain feelings. So if you behave as if you are comfortable, in other words, instead of doing the dance of discomfort, you stand still. Instead of gesturing small and fast and jerky, you are smoother and looser. Instead of, instead of talking too quickly and tripping over your tongue, you speak in a much more measured pace and engage in that action. Those actions will not only make you ultimately feel more comfortable, because that's the chicken and egg, feelings provoke actions, actions provoke feelings, but you'll immediately radiate to the courtroom that you are that comfortable, confident, credible advocate. So let's not worry so much about feelings. They'll take care of themselves. Let's instead worry about actions. And we're going to get control of the actions. And by getting control of the actions, the feelings will become much more under your control. Now, this is technique, not magic. It won't make nervousness vanish, but much more quickly, you will get control of how you're feeling because you will have initial control of how you are behaving. So we need to look at your body when the pressure is on in the courtroom. So to sum up what you've learned so far, think about how athletes often say things to themselves as a way to guide their performance. Like some ball player might say to him or herself, keep your eye on the ball. Well, to find your style, talk to yourself and say this. If I control my body's actions, I will look and feel more confident in court. Say that. Now, say this, because of this paradox of naturalness, being natural is not enough. Say that. I can rely on my technique to improve my style as an advocate. Say that and mean it. So you want to talk to yourself and say these mantras of self-instruction, and that's the way you're going to find your personal style.